All right. Thank you so much. Again, welcome and thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, my name is An. I'm an occupational therapist and project scientist at Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. I'm also an ESPO junior leader for G GSA's health sciences section. And for those who aren't familiar with ESPO, it stands for the Emerging Scholars and Professional Organization. It's a part of GSA and it's a group that's dedicated to supporting people who are students and those who are early on embarking in their careers in gerontology and aging. I'm joined by my co-conspirator and uh, someone who helped me to put this webinar together, Dr. Kyle Moret, who is also a fellow ESPO junior leader for GSA's health sciences section. He's also an assistant scientist in the Department of Mental Health at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And we'd also like to take a moment to also thank um, many GSA staff who helped us to put this webinar together. Thank you so much for their support. Jason Baker, who's here today, who's providing event support, as well as Gina Shoen, who's the director of membership at GSA, who's been instrumental in helping us to put this event together. And again, it's my pleasure to welcome you all. Um, and it's also my pleasure to welcome our esteemed panelists who have been involved in GSA in varying capacities as they'll share more with you today um, to briefly introduce themselves uh, uh, or briefly introduce them. Uh, we've asked them to prepare very brief introductions uh, in terms of you know asking them to think about um, uh, how their experience with navigating career de decisions and being um, members of GSA and uh, how that supported their careers in aging. Uh, so brief introductions for them to get started. We have Dr. Regina Shi, who is the director of the Social and Behavioral Policy Program at the RAND Corporation. We have Dr. Arno, Harriet Arno, who I'm honored to call and consider a colleague, uh, who's a research scientist in the Department of yeah. Nursing Research at Cedar sinai Medical Center. And we have Dr. Elsa Strottmeyer, who's the Associate Professor of Epidemiology and Director of the NIA-funded T32 Epidemiology Epidemiology of Aging Training Program at the University of Pittsburgh Graduate School of Public Health, and is also former chair of the GSA's Health Sciences section. So we want to thank them so much for their time and volunteering their time to be with us today. Um, a little bit of housekeeping just, housekeeping just before we get started. So just to give everybody a brief outline of the session, we'll start off with uh, asking our panelists some prepared questions that we had in mind for them. Uh, and then we'll leave plenty of time at the end for audience Q&A. So if you've got questions, feel free to drop them in the chat box. We'll be monitoring the chat and we'll make sure to circle around to those questions. Or if you want to wait till the end, you know, you can also raise your hand at the end and we can call on you if you want to uh, unmute yourself and, uh, you know, um, share your question out loud to our panelists. And just a reminder for everyone to also make sure that they're muted as well so we can hear our panelists well as we're going. Um, and so with that, I'd really like to just start with um, Again, we've asked our panelists to provide a brief introduction for whatever's relevant to today's topic. Um, and if, if they could ask a, and share uh, about their life and career roles. Uh, uh, so perhaps uh, Dr. Regina Shi, could I ask if you would, wouldn't mind starting for us? Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Regina Shi. It's nice to see you all. And I'm really pleased to be on this panel with Harriet and Elsa. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, um, I am an epidemiologist by training, and I think I was connected via Kyle because we had the same advisor at Johns Hopkins School of Public Health and the Department of Mental Health, um, and I was really focused on the epidemiology of aging and dementia when I was at Hopkins. Um, just a quick life story. Um, I then did a postdoc at NICHD in Maryland, um, and I did it in child health because I wanted a lifespan perspective to aging. And then about 15 years ago, right after my postdoc, I joined RAND, and I have been based out of the Washington, D.C. office, and I've been at RAND for 15 years because I love the policy environment, and I've been able to continue doing research on um, the epidemiology of aging, um, as well as other areas like substance use and transportation equity for older adults and long-term care. Um, and so over the past couple of years, I have transitioned into a leadership position. Um, I am the T32 NIA postdoc director here at RAND. It's been at RAND for 27 years, and I'm honored to take that on. Um, and then I um, am also a program director. And what that means is I oversee the portfolio of research having to do with individual and family well-being across the lifespan, including public health, social services, um, and public benefit programs like WIC and SNAP and um, Medicaid policy. Um, so I all, uh, that also includes aging, um, and um, we have um, a lot of work on aging, disability, and long-term care here at RAND that um, I oversee. Most of our work is funded by NIH, CDC, foundations, and some private sector as well. So that kind of gives you a sense of what a program director does here at RAND. So thank you for um, having me. 
Uh, thank you, Dr. Sheehan. Perhaps just to go in the order that we introduced folks. Uh, Dr. Arano, would, would you go next and briefly introduce yourself? And I believe you're muted, uh, Harriet. Sorry about that. It's my age. It's my white hair showing. Uh, so my name is Harriet Arano. I work in the nursing research department at Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. Uh, I am a social scientist, not a nurse, but I am a seriously strong nurse supporter and appreciator. I have the dual role titles of research scientist for and nursing research and professor of medicine and biomedical sciences. Uh, as a social scientist working in a clinical setting, my research is always interprofessional and team-based. Um, other than my contributions from my um, considerable age, experience, and wisdom as a mentor and leader, I am most often in the role of a research methodologist. So helping to turn the incredible questions and ideas of clinicians into viable research projects. So I research design, data collection methods, analyses, interpretation, write up the basics of research. My own research has dually focused on a nurse model of in-home preventive health care for older adults and also uh, applied to older adults aging with, not into, but with disability, either lifelong disability or disability acquired in uh, younger years, and uh, dually on improving health care outcomes for frail older adults who are transitioning in and out of health care settings. Of course, work and life balance. I am also a mother and a grandmother living on the same property with one daughter and her family. So I share cooking and childcare duties. And uh, I've always been involved in various community arts and political groups. And that pretty much describes me. Thank you so much, Dr. Arnell. And um, Dr. Strautmeyer, an introduction from you. Sure. Um, I'm Elsa Strautmeyer. I'm a tenured associate professor in the Department of Epidemiology at the School of Public Health at the University of Pittsburgh. I also direct in the department our NIH NIA T32 in the Epidemiology of Aging. And we have um, pre-doctoral fellows as well as postdoctoral fellows. So I'm very involved in sort of advising for career paths within the training grant. I did complete my um, all of my graduate training at the University of Pittsburgh, as well as a subsequent postdoc there, and then continued on as faculty. And so some of what I have to say has to do with you know, how I made those decisions to stay. Um, so my work is in the epidemiology of aging and focuses on risk factors, um, primarily metabolic risk factors related to neuromuscular and musculoskeletal declines in the etiology of fall injuries, mobility disability, and disability. And um, I've had lots of different types of funding. My primary funding throughout my career has been NIH funding, but also have had foundation funding and um, organizational and pharmaceutical type funding. So I can sort of speak to those different um, methods of sort of having your supporting your career along. And it meant it was mentioned that I'm past chair of GSA Health Sciences section, and I've also been heavily involved in the American Society for Bone and Mineral Research through my work. Um, I have two kids who are now teenagers, and so some of what I have to say, you know, relates to, to balancing family and work things um, as I've progressed in my career. Thank you so much, Elsa, and we look forward to hearing about all those wonderful things. Uh, I, and so I'd like to just move on to a uh, first question that we had prepared for our panelist speakers. We asked them if they could think about telling us a story about uh, how they got to where they are in their career and really focusing on considering where their key pivotal moments of transition. For example, perhaps they changed career tracks or research settings or industries. Those are just examples of uh, things we asked them to think about. And knowing what they know now, uh, any advice that they would give to their younger selves to help navigate those transitions or to other folks who might be considering similar career decisions or um, similar transitions, potentially. And I'll just keep uh, with the order that we've got uh, since we've started. Uh, Dr. Shi, would you mind starting for us? Sure, happy to. Um... And you can cut me off if I get too too wordy. Um, so after I finished my um, 
Department of Mental Health Epidemiology degree at, at, at Hopkins, um, I really struggled and I wasn't sure what I wanted to do or to be. Um, so I, I went into a postdoc because I really wanted a lifespan perspective, as I mentioned earlier. And NICHD, NICHD at the time was planning a very large epidemiological study called the National Children's Study. And so it was meant to look at um, 100,000 children across the United States, recruited from preconception all the way, followed all the way until they were 21. And I thought that this was where I could spend my entire career. Um, you know, at the time, it was a lot of older scientists on the team, and they said to me, you could age with this cohort and be the, you know, uh, a, a leader in the science of developing this huge cohort study. Um, at the time, I was kind of in the intramural division of NICHD, and I, I highly recommend, um, you know, postdocs in the federal government. It gives you a great insight into how things are funded and prioritization of, of topics within NIH. Um, but, you know, it was an interesting position because I was in an intramural division, but I was um, in a path to becoming an extramural program officer. So I was offered a job as a program officer of, um, at NICHD. Um, and the reason why I didn't take it was because I really wanted to prove to myself that I could be an independent investigator and that I could go out and find funding. And so I thought, maybe this isn't the right time to be a program officer. Now, I do know a lot of program officers, and they do amazing work, and they set the direction of research at NIH. So uh, I wouldn't rule that out as an amazing career pathway. Um, but I really wanted to try, try it out as a, as a faculty research member of, of the scientific community. So um, I applied a lot of places, and I really found RAND to be a place where I could pursue many diverse interests. I wasn't just interested in aging and dementia. Having done a postdoc at NICHD, I was also interested in child development. I was interested in perinatal health and reproductive health. And so RAND really offered me the opportunity to um, identify a lot of diverse areas that I could do work in. And so if you look at my CV, I've done work on sleep, and substance use, I've done work on neighborhoods, I've done work on long-term care, I've also done work on brain imaging. So um, it's, it's been a place where I've been able to really follow my dreams and follow the money and not worry so much about being a renowned expert in one area, which I think a lot of my academic colleagues are known for. Um, a career pivot for me was really making that choice to to go to RAND. And I wasn't sure I would ever be here this long. It's been 15 years, but I really love the environment. And what RAND has really taught me as an epidemiologist is to, to think through a policy lens and ask myself, why is this important to research to do from a policy perspective? So that's the kind of pivot that I made, the choice that I made, um, and really happy with the decision still to this day. Um, I'm not gonna pretend like it's easy to be an independent investigator. But um, I've also been able to um, kind of carve out the flexibility in my work-life balance that has definitely fluctuated throughout life events, um, including having children. And so I've just been really grateful to be a part of this community of researchers in a nonprofit research organization that's very policy focused. Um, and it's considered kind of quasi academic. So I have a little bit of taste of all different kinds of experiences here at RAND. That's perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Xi. Um, and perhaps uh, moving on uh, to Dr. Arno, uh, could you also respond to this prompt, sharing us a, a story of how you got to where you are in your career? Any sure. key pivots or transitions uh, you'd like to share? Uh, being a little bit older than everybody, I also probably have made more pivots than, than most. Um, so this is how I got to be where I am now. And uh, I may be making some assum assumptions, but I've heard this many times from many people, possibly like many of you. Um, I started out, I had special relationships with my grandparents' generation, with my great aunts and uncles, and my various older cousins. Uh, and that probably did a certain amount of setting uh, my trajectory from a very early age. But there were three pivotal moments in my own sort of academic and career development where I transitioned into gerontology. When I got out of my undergraduate career, I was uh, I majored in social psychology and I was interested in clinical psychology. And I had an experience, my work experience of being a research assistant in psychiatry on two research projects. The first was on the development of uh, community psychiatry when hospitals were first held accountable by, uh, by Medicare, basically, Medicare and Medicaid, 
uh, for serving a specific catchment area in which they were located. In, in our case, it was the south end of Boston. And uh, this was an eye-opening experience for the psychiatry who had always served a suburban um, uh, clientele. The second was a project at Mass General Hospital in which we taught psychiatry residents how to negotiate with patients in a walk-in emergency psychiatric clinic lo located in the emergency department on how to get a satisfactory referral in four visits. They were limited by four visits. By asking the question, how do you hope I can help you today? And then parsing the, that out in negotiation with their, with their patients. Uh, so not only did these experiences shape my interest in person-centered and community-centered research, but also changed my interest from clinical psychology to more systems and uh, an organizational change focus. So the second pivot, I went to graduate school and uh, majored in something in a, in a field that was called at the time public policy psychology. It, would, um, it was the application of social science methods to uh, public issues of public policy. So in our department, there were people studying education, environment, justice system, and health services. And I'm, I was in the health services cohort. And probably today that would be called health services research, but there wasn't a field called health services research when I got my doctorate. My advisor worked in a rehabilitation hospital. I followed him to work there. I did all my graduate school research in that setting and got paid for it. I negotiated projects of interest to the hospital that would also satisfy graduates, graduate coursework and both, both my master's thesis and dissertation. I highly advise if you're, on the, if you're in graduate school, if you're a student, I highly advise following that path if you can manage it. This, and this experience set me on my course to working in applied health delivery settings and firmly rooted me in the rehabilitation model. So team-based, focused on person functioning in the community. community. Sound familiar? Sound a little bit like gerontology. The, uh, the CEO in that hospital taught me to write in simple language, tell a story with my, with my research results, and he told me to always give him some idea of what action my findings suggested that he and his board of directors should follow. So that really was a very important pivot for me. The third transition was associated with the realization that rehabilitation and gerontology had the same underlying model. And that really led me into geriatrics and gerontology. I did a postdoc at Rand and UCLA in uh, rehabilitation and in health policy research. Uh, the second half of that postdoc, different funding source, was a research project on ageism and its effects on cancer treatment uh, decisions. Then because I was well-versed in health services research and had always worked in doing research in applied settings, which was uh, someone, something that was not that common in those days, I was recruited by two UCLA geriatricians to run a large community-based field study of a nurse-based in-home preventive health care program for older adults. That was in 1988, and I've been in gerontology and nursing ever since. So as far as advice to navigating these transitions, you, you, know, you need to know where your passion leads you. And on the other hand, what kinds of situations get in your way? And the best example of that was and is interesting. There's a chat here from somebody who was um, a student at the University of Laverne when I was there. So this example, by the way, has to do with the University of Laverne. Um, I didn't think I had anything to teach. I was not an academic. I wasn't in an academic setting until I was in my 50s. And I realized that I had an incredible experience that I could share. Um, and I got a great position teaching in a master's program in gerontology and in health services, uh, as well as mentoring faculty and research and starting the universities uh, in IRB. This was a university that was transitioning from being a teaching university to a research university. I thought that being in a university setting would open up my opportunities to get grants, but uh, the academic pace of research was so slow. 
uh, especially among my colleagues who were tenured, and that was all of them. And I also realized that I loved having my research contribute to real decisions about how to best deliver services. So when the opportunity arose, I made the jump back to healthcare delivery setting. So now my thrills at teaching, and there are thrills associated with teaching, are gotten by mentoring and teaching and honing the research skills of clinicians and other non-research members of the teams that I work in. So another word of advice, um, and this is from my own experience, it's not necessarily going to be your experience, but I have learned to lead from behind. And if you make the choice to work in interprofessional teams and in applied settings, you may not always be the first author or principal investigator. Alternatively, you may be entirely in settings without a research infrastructure, and that's okay too. Build on what you have and what makes you feel right. But I, my advice is to really try to use what your evaluation, what your research, or whatever you call it, or whatever you, you know, to contribute to improving the health and well being of older adults or those who are aging at whatever age. So try to carve out, and this is not easy, especially when you're balancing work and, and family. Try to, and, and, a, and a job that may or may not reward this, try to carve out the time to publish, to contribute to the literature and, and knowledge in your chosen field. So, and finally, is uh, in GSA membership, um, related to GSA membership, GSA and uh, what was called uh, Association for Health Services Research or Academy Health and the uh, ACRM, the, the um, Association of Rehab Medicine, anyways, uh, were the organizations that were and are my homes. And, and now I've recently added the American Academy of Nursing. Um, I found some people who, who, like me, span those organizations and interests. And these were the networks that I, build and explore, I built and explored throughout my career. GSA helped me to create my professional identity. I used to submit abstracts and attend every meeting where I could present because that would be only meetings that I could get funding to attend. Uh, I'm less active now in these professional organizations because frankly, I'm no longer building my own career, but I'm very supportive of my colleagues engagement involvement. This is, contributes again to my being more likely to be a second or third or last author rather than a first author, but I'm really supportive of my colleagues. I never rose to leadership positions in, in, in my organizations and that I sometimes regret. I probably would have uh, had I been in an academic setting for which appointment and promotions uh, relied on this kind of leadership. And now, in fact, in my own organization, these activities do play a role. But instead, I chose uh, leadership roles in my own healthcare system and uh, building, using that to build more interprofessional networks and teams, research teams, and various other volunteer community groups and balanced with work and family as well. So get involved, go to meetings, network, build and maintain re relationships across, across institutions. And this last point I think is especially important that you build across institution networks. Um, it's essential. Multi-site research collaboratives are so important for getting research funding, but for also raising the impact of your findings from local to regional to national and international. So those, those multi-site and multi-institution connections are so important. And some, I, I regret nothing. I've enjoyed every step of the way. I still love walking onto my hospital campus every time I go to campus and I know that I'm making a contribution. So thank you and I'm happy to answer any questions when we get to questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Arnell. Many pivots with many things to learn from all of them. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, Dr. Stottmeyer, a story from you. Sure. Um, so I would say that compared to the first two speakers, my path has been more traditionally academic career with um, traditional academic career benchmarks. Um, so I made 
probably the field pivot was early in my career. I was working as a PhD student in diabetes and molecular epidemiology. And at the end of my PhD, I had family reasons for remaining in Pittsburgh. And so I was looking for a postdoc in the same city as my doctoral training. And at the time when I was finishing, um, that was not encouraged. It, the advice was that you should look for a postdoc, not at the same institution, not in the same city that you should try to diversify. And so um, I, I should say that I don't agree with that advice. I think it has to do with if you can, in your next training experience, obtain, um, continue to grow your career and learn different things. And so it's pretty well established that um, women prefer to make changes or not as many changes based on family reasons. And so I think it's somewhat of a sexist advice to say that people should have to go all over everywhere, you know, at any time point. And so it's very, it's not realistic to everyone. And so you need to make decisions based on what's right for you and your family. And so um, at the time I was lucky because um, aging in at the University of Pittsburgh is very multidisciplinary and there's a huge amount of people working in that area. And so I was able to, at then my PhD, have a postdoc in aging research where I was getting a lot of different training than my training that was initially based um, from my PhD. And so I made a decision to stay based on the fact that I could you know, get that additional training in the same location and also um, stay for family reasons. And um, I had a two-year postdoc fellowship. And during that postdoc fellowship, uh, the universe, the department was supporting applications to um, get support to become an assistant professor. And so at the University of Pittsburgh right now, it's more challenging, but they a lot of universities will allow you to stay if you obtain independent funding to support your position. And so I had funding from the American Diabetes Association and a junior faculty award um, to maintain my, my full coverage of my salary. And I transitioned as an into an assistant professor in a non-tenure track. During that period of my junior faculty award, which was foundation support or foundation and um, organizational supported for my salary, I did um, submit and obtain an R01. And so at that time, um, I was able to apply and transition to a tenure, tenure track position as an assistant professor. And so that's how I sort of moved from spot to spot. Um, I've uh, been very fortunate to have continued NIH support um, and also, as I mentioned, support from other um, organizations and foundations and pharma. And so at Pittsburgh, that's basically what's required to obtain tenure in addition to all of the publishing and service and teaching. And so um, I did you know, go through the tenure track. I had one stop on the tenure track for um, childcare. One of my children was born when I was um, not on the tenure track, another one when I was. And so many universities will stop your tenure track if you have uh, a child in that time. So I did have a one year stop on the tenure track for um, childcare. And then um, I also wanted to remain in Pittsburgh. You know, there were several times when I considered changing locations, but my children's grandparents were really uh, very critical in providing childcare and a lot of family support for me. And so I didn't feel like I could have the career I wanted to have if I didn't also have that family support. So it was very deliberate on my part to be at a place where I felt you know, I was supported as well as my career. And so you have to make that decision. Like you can't stay somewhere. You don't think that you're going to be supported because you're going to not like your career. <laughs> so it was like, it, it was something that was really important to me. And I think that we think too much about making decisions just for the career and you have to make them for you too. Thank you so much, Dr. Stottmeyer. I'm definitely hearing a theme of, you know, just family considerations and balancing um, family needs as well. And thank you so much to, to everyone for their responses uh, to sharing their story of how they've gotten to where they are and navigating some of those key uh, transition periods. I was also hoping to ask, you know, uh, we're hoping to get your sense of how GSA and being a member of, of GSA has helped you or supported you in your career. Um, you know, what advice would you give to 
new members of GSA in terms of getting involved and making the most of their, their membership. Um, and, and Dr. Arnau was already speaking to this a little bit, but if you could also share perhaps perspectives in terms of, you know, how does your membership or your engagement in GSA perhaps change over time? How, how does that look like, you know, from when you were early on in your careers versus more later stages? Um, and I'll just keep us in the order we've been going on. Uh, Dr. Shi, would you like to respond to that prompt? Sure. Yeah. So early on, um, and I've been going to GSA and I try to go annually ever since I was a, a pre-doc um, and I love GSA. Um, early on in my career, I used it as a networking opportunity to not only see colleagues from other you know, schools of public health, um, but also to um, network with program officers. And those program officers were critical for me, um, particularly the ones from NIA in kind of sharing with me the direction of research funding at NIA and NIMH in the Geriatric Psychiatry Division of NIMH. And so um, just having that kind of face-to-face -face interaction with program officers, I think was really invaluable because they could see you, know, you as a presenter, as a researcher, as an emerging scholar, um, and just having that, that touch point was really helpful. Um, I also remember you know, using GSA as a, you know, a place to um, meet up with other pre-docs where we could think about paper ideas, presentation panels. Um, and then later in my career, um, I used GSA at a critical point in my career. Um, up until about 2015 or so, I had really been focusing on dementia epidemiology and the social epi of aging. But in, in around that time, um, a colleague of mine, Michael Hurd at RAND, published a landmark study on the cost of dementia showing that it was the most costly condition in America um, on par with heart disease and cancer. It made the front page news of the New York Times. Um, and NIA in turn changed its funding strategy to invest more in dementia research. Um, and um, with Michael Hurd, um, our president at RAND asked me um, to take on a short-term project to lay out the vision for the next phase of dementia research at RAND. And so, um, you know, both Michael Hurd and the president of Brand said, what should we be doing next? Now that we have this important new statistic about the cost of dementia, what's really the next step for, for us at Rand and, and the entire scientific community? I went to GSA that November and it was um, a critical point for me because I just soaked everything up like a sponge. What I ultimately determined um, in part based on my participation in GSA, just as an audience member, was that one of the most important fields to focus on was family caregiving and long-term care because the vast majority of costs of dementia are not in healthcare, but in long-term care and caregiving. And family caregivers bear a very large brunt of dementia care um, in addition to everything they do to facilitate person-centered care in healthcare settings. So I remember just furiously taking notes at multiple GSA panels because I knew nothing about long-term care, but it was this amazing place that brought together the, you know, preeminent scholars on long-term care and aging. And so I kind of got a crash course in dementia and caregiving, I'm sorry, in long-term care and caregiving um, that fall when I went to GSA. Um, I then produced a report that outlined some key considerations on dementia long-term care policy. That resulted in me briefing the National Advisory Council on Research Services and Education for Alzheimer's Disease, which was a congressionally mandated committee. Um, so I, I now have a YouTube video on HHS, <laughs> hhs.gov website um, of, my, of my presentation to the committee on that um, report that I produced on dementia long-term care. It's, it's called the Dementia Long-Term Care Blueprint. Um, and I've also been asked to testify to Congress um, on what the Medicare Special um, Senate Committee should be doing to advance dementia care. So without having that kind of crash course that I got in one you know, session, um, one, one annual conference at GSA, I don't think I would have been able to get up to speed on like what to focus on and who were the important stakeholders in the space. Because you had researchers, you had consultants, you had policymakers the providers all kind of convening at GSA. And so it was a really important moment in my career to focus um, rather than solely dementia epidemiology to kind of shift in dementia long-term care. So that kind of, um, that, that GSA meeting was really uh, an inflection point for me. And since then I've done a lot more work now on long-term care and family caregiving as it pertains to dementia and aging. Thank you so much, Dr. Shi. 
And Dr. Arno, I, I heard you speaking already before to some of the benefits of uh, GSA membership. Is there anything else you wanted to add in relation to this question? And that's okay if not. Uh, actually, yes, based on what Regina was just saying. Um, I found GSA, well, first of all, I loved going, I, I still love going to GSA meetings if I haven't, even if I haven't been for the last uh, three and a half, four years. Um, but um, going to the, in the exhibitor section, every time I would go to uh, GSA, I would sit down and have a wonderful chat with Dr. Robin Barr, who attended all of those meetings personally and sat at the NIA, you know, or, uh, table. And uh, even though I'm in a, a strange position because it's not easy to access NIH funding from uh, non-academic settings. So I never have never gotten funding from NIA. Um, I've gotten pretty regular steady funding from foundation sources uh, and, and now from uh, PCORI. Um, but um, it was still so valuable to talk with the representatives from NIH, you know, that would uh, be at those meetings. The other thing that was hugely important for, for shaping my own research skills was the access that I had, again, through the, now we probably learn about these things in school and you learn and you get access through the internet. But at that time, the access to these large public databases Longitudinal Study on Aging, uh, the National Center for Health Statistics with their uh, hospital discharge survey and uh, the, the ambulatory care survey. It's where I got my access to learning how to use these large databases. And uh, it was, and, and understanding them both their good and their, their shortcomings, their, their value and their shortcomings. And what that has done for me in terms of my career is having that early experience of using, exploring, um, writing from them, doing analysis, teaching from them, which I, you know, I use them in my brief career of teaching. It's tra it trained me to use electronic health record data, it to, it, and other large data sources and databases and to work with our, um, uh, the IT people. IT, IT departments and big health, health systems have gotten much smarter. There's much more clinical knowledge in those systems, but there wasn't always. And there's still, it's still, you know, they're not clinicians. Um, but it trained me also to work with those, with those IT people to understand, to validate, and to use those, you know, those data sources as, um, uh, you know, as outcomes, as, as important factors in my, in my research, in our research um, in, uh, at the, in the healthcare system. So that was something else that GSA really led me into that. Fabulous. Thank you so much. And Dr. Stratmeyer, I know you've got a ton of enrollment in GSA. I'm very excited to hear from you um, in terms of how GSA has benefited <laughs> you. Um, well, I, I joined when I was a postdoc because my postdoc was in aging and I hadn't been in the field before. So GSA was really critical in sort of getting me up to speed uh, about the field as a part of, I consider it a part of my postdoc training. Um, it's for sure my favorite meeting that I go to because I love the multidisciplinary nature of the meeting. I love that it feels like a smaller organizational meeting compared to some of the other meetings that I attend, like the American Diabetes Association or the American Society for Bone and Mineral Research have like, you know, tens and tens of thousands of people. And it just, it's a very different feel. Um, so I always enjoy going to the meetings uh, because, it, because of those reasons. Um, it helps me creatively because I like how hearing about aging from other perspectives versus my own research when I'm at GSA. So it's definitely helped me sort of idea generate and think of papers and grants and things like that and what to consider and analysis. Um, this kind sounds kind of like a funny thing to say, but 
because the aging research group at the University of Pittsburgh is so enormous, GSA actually helped connect me more within my own university to different people doing aging. And this sounds so funny, but if you were here, you'd understand there's just so many people doing aging. You don't actually see them all the time when you're at the university. And so we'd have like uh, Pittsburgh type groups or events prior to GSA or at GSA. And so um, that was really helpful for me as a young investigator in networking within my own university, but multidisciplinary ideas for grants and projects and papers. Um, so I think that's really important to make connections, you know, not even within just the larger aging community, but within the people you know. So I also saw, I'm a part of a lot of different multi-center studies, but I'd see investigators from those multi-center studies at GSA that helped with grants and papers. Um, it was networking as well with people that I didn't come in contact with through those other avenues, which was important to me since I did stay in the same place. And so um, I know we haven't had the opportunity to network in person, but to me, going and talking to people face to face were really was really important for generating papers and grant ideas and future projects. There's just something about being in person that sometimes those ideas and discussions, you know, are able to push those things forward a little bit more. So I really worry about some of you who are early career who we haven't had that opportunity for a few years, and I'm super excited that we're going to get to do it this year because. I I've been concerned about people's careers, basically, because so much happens that's um, informal at GSA, but so important to the formal things that can end up being generated as products from these informal discussions. Thank you so much. And thank you so much again to all our panelists for responding to those questions we had prepared. Them did an excellent job. I'd like to turn things over. I believe we've got about 15 or 16 minutes left to, for some audience Q&A. And Kyle will be leading this section, so I'll turn it over to him. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Ann. And thank you to all of our speakers today. Um, I don't know if you see the chat, but we have some people commenting, um, appreciating the honesty and transparency that you've all um, have uh, shared with your stories here um, and how they've impacted your life. Uh, decisions and career decisions. Um, and then, uh, so yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd love to open it up for questions here. And I had some additional questions on my own I could ask as well. Um, and we have in the chat to um, Nicole Crawford mentioning, um, yeah, not being able to network in person um, has been tough. Um, and I know sort of as an early career researcher myself, it's been sort of a weird few years. Uh, not being able to do that. Um, and she actually asked, uh, do you have any recommendations on how to better network even when you can't go to GSA, particularly probably when in virtual settings, as a lot of these meetings still have been virtual? Well, I think things like GSA is doing like these webinars and sessions, Zoom sessions are really important. So I have actually made connections with early career people the last few years through some of the GSA sessions. So if you get a chance to participate in one of those, even if you can't go to the annual meeting, and certainly we all know budgets everywhere are crunched right now and it, travel is expensive, just make sure you're participating in the other things that GSA offers that are virtual, I think. Sounds great. Yeah. Um, does anybody else have any any questions? Um, let's see. Oh, it looks like uh, we have some folks raising their hands. Um, uh, Rujeko, you're welcome to unmute and ask your question. Um, awesome. Can I be heard? Okay. Yes, Great. we can hear you. Um, awesome. Thank you so much uh, to our panelists for um, the great presentations. I really appreciate you all kind of bringing in the different um, experiences because I actually resonated with each and every one of you in some capacity. So thank you. Um, my question is to Dr. Shi. Um, when you mentioned how you wanted to have a um, experience across lifespan, how did that, um, how was that received in the world 
of academia or the traditional world, I would say, um, because there's this, you know, traditional thought of you have to be an expert in a specific thing and stick to that. But it seems like things are changing a little bit. So I just wanted to hear that transition. Um, and then I think also Dr. Uh, Strottmeyer, you mentioned how you did gerontology as your postdoc. That's when that started. So if um, both of you can just kind of touch on that, I'll appreciate. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, you know, maybe back then, um, I don't think I had even labeled my desire to do a postdoc in children's health as a lifespan perspective. Um, a little bit about this is, is actually packaging, how you describe yourself. So I'm being fully transparent here in that um, I went to NICHD to understand early life determinants of late life health. I didn't call it a lifespan perspective until I left and realized that I did get a lifespan perspective. Um, you know, one of my, uh, I call her my academic sister. She, she had been doing work on the genetic determinants of dementia. And when she defended her dissertation, of course, I was in the room because I wanted to see how it was going to go um, in, you know, kind of looking at the future that I was going to be in that seat, that hot seat in a year. Um, one of her um, advisors on her committee asked her, do you think we can actually prevent dementia? And she said, not unless we start in utero and before that, because there are so many environmental, genetic, social determinants of dementia. And that really stuck with me because I felt like, yeah, there's no silver bullet here for any chronic condition in late life. Um, and so we have to think about this in a multifaceted way. And the best opportunity that I felt um, fit my desires to look at all different kinds of topics, not just aging, was to do a postdoc in early childhood development. Um, I think it's been a really um, interesting path for me to go from aging to early life and then to go to a place like RAND. Um, I've actually been able to capitalize on having a lot of different kind of research experiences when I do um, write up proposals. Um, and so I did get this training in kind of a lifespan perspective. And now that I look back, I do see that major um, mentors in my, in my life have been bridging kind of early life with late life. So George Reebok, for example, is a researcher in the Department of Mental Health at Hopkins. And he does work on youth and he does work on older adults. And he has been merging that together. Um, there are many intergenerational kind of dynamics that we can use to benefit both young people and older adults. And so there are lots of research avenues to pursue on kind of intergenerational connections to health and well-being. Um, and so I've, I've actually been um, really privileged to have a lot of diverse research experiences. It's not for everybody. Um, and, you know, if you, if you <laughs> kind of looks like, like I'm all, all over the place, but I really like it like that. Um, it keeps me excited um, and always thinking on my toes. Um, I can, you know, kind of pitch myself in different ways to different audiences. Um, like if I were to talk to substance use at CBTD, which is another conference, you know, I would have a totally different orientation, but I like having that. And now I'm, that I'm um, further along in my career, I can start to see connections. So for example, I'm starting to think about HIV in, in older adults. I'm starting to think about substance use in older adults, opioid use in older adults, sleep in older adults, even though I've done most of that work in adolescence. So it's been, um, it's been, it's been a, just a, a fun journey. <laughs> Yeah, and I'll, I'll echo some of the things Dr. Sheed said. I, I think I'm really drawn to aging because of sort of the multidisciplinary nature. And so when I applied for my postdoc, I had been as a doctoral student working on a project that was examining type 1 diabetes as a predictor of early menopause in women. And so it had an aging focus to that work in diabetes. And so when I applied to the postdoc, uh, my goal was to actually identify early aging that was happening in diabetes. And even though not all these populations were the older populations, it has a similar, what we now call life course approach. And I totally agree with Dr. Shi, that was not something that was being termed that back in those days. But, you know, some of us did come to aging because we were doing that type of work. And so I think that it's really important that people in aging do have a lot of diverse perspectives because there's so much that contributes to aging. And that's sort of how I got from 
my pre-doc to my postdoc as I had proposed these projects. Um, and Dr. Jane Cauley and Dr. Ann Newman, who are leaders um, in the field um, of aging epidemiology, were the two postdoc mentors that I had and um, also were really keen on supporting me looking at those measures and diabetes you know, related to early aging. I'm going to step in just to make a little comment about sort of the, some of these accidental turns. Um, when I when I finished my postdoc, I went back to work in rehabilitation medicine and, re, and research. And um, but I was I was now completely converted to this in concept of an in-home preventive health care program, um, and for older adults and. I thought, well, we should apply this to people who are aging with disabilities because we, uh, the, the focus at that time was very limited in rehabilitation to the beginning, you know, when somebody was discharged from an acute rehab, from acute care to rehabilitation, and they were sent home. And what happened when they were sent home? It, nobody really knew. So I wanted to apply that model to people who were aging with acquired disabilities. But the first funding that sort of just fell into my lap of my first independent um, research funding was to apply this model to people aging with lifelong disabilities. So with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And so the age at which people really begin to age with intellectual and or developmental disabilities is really drops you back into the people in their 30s. And I've been continuously working with that age range and the, that population until finally um, it's become more publicly aware, you know, so that, that there's now, if I were at a different point in my career, there's now funding to look exactly at those issues of people who are aging not into disability, which most people do, but aging with disabilities. Wonderful. Um, are there any additional questions from the audience? If not, I have a, another question. Um, so yeah, I can ask um, for the panelists too, uh, you know, what advice would you give to a new GS, GSA member who's interested in getting more involved um, with the society? I, I have been very involved across my career. And so I think, you know, GSA has a lot of opportunities even for early career people to join. And, you know, of course, Kyle and Ann are great examples of that. But, you know, there are lots of committees that have membership for the early career people. And so I think you can learn a lot from being on these committee memberships. They're not a substantial amount of time, but you can contribute. It's really important in the organizations to have the early career perspectives. And I think the only way we can have those is if you are on committees. And I'm speaking now as someone who's at a later stage and sort of managing committees and more senior in, in GSA. But I think that I really appreciated working with our early career people at GSA. It's a different perspective. It's important we keep the field fresh, that we go in new directions, that we are addressing concerns that are important for early career people. And so, um, I am so excited to talk to people and have people join things. I think maybe it's hard to imagine when you're early in your career that, you know, we want you to be there as much as you might want to be there. <laughs> so it goes both ways. I would just add that, um, you know, GSA is a great opportunity to take on leadership roles and they can be small or large. Um, but every committee you sit on, every kind of thing you raise your hand for is an opportunity that you will put on your CV. And no matter if you go into academia, into practice, into policy, into consulting, people want to see experience like that. It's not only about publishing, it's about your experience. And that goes to my other related comment, which is to build your network. And GSA is a great way to do that. 
GSA and other kind of um, convenings that build your network are really critical to your future career paths and the direction of your research. And it's not just academics either. I think it's been um, really important to build my network with community-based organizations, with policymakers, with practitioners. You know, we, we can't um, land our journal article with a recommendation that is completely infeasible for community members or providers. So we can't just say, policymakers should be doing this or healthcare providers should be doing this without really fully understanding their challenges and their voice in the research. You can't do that unless you have a really solid network and the depth of knowledge that comes with um, interacting with those different types of stakeholders. So um, building your network is absolutely key. Yeah, you know, we tend to be as academics kind of um, lone foxes, islands, <laughs> you know, we really just want to be uh, autonomous, but it is really beneficial to, to build that network and um, get that perspective from a lot of diverse audiences. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, and we have uh, a couple minutes left um, before, we have one more question I can ask real quick. Um, before that, um, I just want to say the speakers have generously um, allowed me to share their contact information uh, with the group too. If anybody here had follow-up um, uh, questions or anything like that, and I can share that in the chat as I ask this last question here. Um, but from Salama Locke, um, GSA has been a leader in reforming aging and reframing aging and combating ageism. And uh, they ask how, or have any, of the speakers experienced ageism and within their organization and networking experiences? Um, and what do you do in those cases? Um, I, I'm gonna respond to that being the oldest person in the, in the room, I think. Um, as, as I said on my most recent birthday, I'm 75 and still alive. Um, I have never in, in my healthcare settings, I have never experienced ageism, any, um, uh, any bias associated with uh, being um, uh, older, either in grant getting or in, um, uh, in our research teams. In fact, I'm, they're not letting me retire. I'm having difficulty extricating myself. But I have experienced um, uh, sexism, and probably everybody, every woman in this room, and maybe others who are uh, of different gender identities may have uh, experienced um, uh, gender uh, bias. Um, I went, we were once turned down a beautiful grant proposal that we wrote. We, there was interprofessional, it was all women. And the critique that we got back from NIH was, these are all nurses. <laughs> uh, so it was, it was extremely um, disturbing, let's put it that way, that uh, we had a, a, a grant turned down on, you know, somebody believing that just because we were women, we were all nurses. Um, yeah, I'll say that, you know, I'm still younger in my career, so I don't think I personally have experienced ageism, but I've watched some ageism happen. And so I think the important thing, and this is what GSA advocates, is that you step in and say something if you observe ageism happening where you are. So that's what I've tried to do. Um, I have noticed it certainly, um, for people at the university maybe who don't do aging research or aren't as familiar with you know, ageism, that you have to sort of point it out to people, that it's not okay to be dismissive of people. It's not okay to talk down to people based on their age or make certain assumptions. And so I think it's just, I've seen it as more like a part of the education experience that my expertise contributes to the university and healthcare community that I'm involved in. Um, yeah, I'll echo sexism for sure. You know, I, I, and this said, I'm very, very thankful to NIH, but I have had NIH experiences um, where either reviews or um, specific staff at NIH have made sexist comments to me very early in career, my career. It has to do with um, like 
comments like, and I will say NIH has been very proactive of this lately. So I'm certainly not knocking NIH right now for what they're doing, but I had experiences in my career where grant reviews would have comments about uh, maybe a publishing gap was related to having children because of the age or something like that. So there are very specific you know, comments that I would receive on grants and from SROs related to my gender, which were not appreciated by me, but I will say I had very, very strong uh, senior female mentors with families who encouraged me to push through. And my best advice for that is just keep going and find a different way and don't listen to it. <laughs> you know? So that's that's what I did. There's just the you're going to get it, but, you know, just try not to pay any attention. So it's that advice is a little different from the ageism advice. You know, the ageism, I've always been tried to be very active. And certainly I would step in if I saw sexism happening, too. But when it happens, those things happen to you you know, certainly speak up. And, you know, I told, for example, my project officer when that would happen, I would tell them about that. And, you know, so tell other people, but, you know, some of that, you just have to keep going, you know, it's in anything that's competitive, they're going to be people who try to hold you back and you just don't listen to it. <laughs> you know, don't worry about it. Thank you so much. Um, and then we're unfortunately out of time for today and just to be mindful of everyone's time. Um, but thank you so much, uh, Dr. Strautmeyer, Dr. Arwano, and uh, Dr. Shi, who had to jump off uh, for giving your time to us today. And uh, we really appreciate your perspectives on navigating these challenging career decisions, especially a lot of us here being early career researchers. Um, so uh, thank you so much. And uh, and folks on the call, um, yeah, we included a re um, on and my contact information as well. If you had any feedback from this session or any thoughts, um, if you like this type of session, we can do more in the future um, through health sciences. Um, but yeah, just let us know and thank you so much. Thank you. And I just put in the chat, anyone's welcome.